Trinidad and Tobago, once a relatively poor place claimed by the Spanish, is now English-speaking and one of the wealthiest countries per capita in the Americas. To see how two separate islands, only six miles off the coast of Venezuela, ended up as two distinct British colonies and then a single country, join me for a brief explainer on the history and politics of Trinidad and Tobago. The first European to set foot in either island was Christopher Columbus when he stumbled upon Trinidad on his third voyage in 1498. He named it La Isla de la Trinidad after the day of the Holy Trinity, the day when he had begun his trip across the ocean, May 30th. At the time, Caribs and Arawaks were the island's sole inhabitants. Given that the island lacked much in the way of gold or other precious metals, the Spanish initially gave it only scant attention, but that did not mean that they left the islanders in peace. In the 16th century, many of the Trinidadians were captured by Spanish slave traders and sent to work in other Spanish possessions. The Spanish began to pay more attention to the island after the stories of the mythical land of gold of El Dorado began circulating. Multiple explorers came searching for it and attempted to set up colonies in 1530, 1532, and 1550, but they all failed. In effect, there was no Spanish presence in Trinidad until 1592, when Antonio de Berrio, a veteran soldier from the Italian Wars, took official possession of the island and founded San Jose of Aruña, a town just east of Port of Spain, later renamed St. Joseph. This served as the capital until 1784. The Spanish were not the only ones that had heard of El Dorado, however, and in 1595, Sir Walter Raleigh raided the island of Trinidad, first the small stockade at Port of Spain and later St. Joseph itself, where he captured Governor de Berrio and released five native Indian chiefs whom Berrio had bound with one long chain, tortured and left to starve. Raleigh did not stick around though, as he continued on his way to try to find El Dorado, and thus the island remained within Spanish domain. It would not be the last time the British attacked Trinidad. After 1595, the development of the island proceeded slowly. There was little interest in migrating there, especially as the island produced little in the way of export. But for those who came, there was the hope of being awarded an encomienda. The encomienda was a labor system, rewarding conquerors, with the labor of a specified number of natives from a specific community, with indigenous leaders in charge of mobilizing the assessed tribute and labor. The Spanish encomenderos were to take responsibility for instruction in the Christian faith, protection from warring tribes, suppressing rebellion against Spaniards, protection against pirates, instruction in the Spanish language and development, and maintenance of infrastructure. In return, the natives would provide tributes in the form of metals, maize, wheat, pork, or any other agricultural product. In the first decades of the Spanish presence in the Caribbean, Spaniards divided up the natives, who in some cases were worked relentlessly. The old Spanish families in Trinidad, that is, those dating back to the time of the conquistadors, had been granted large tracts of land in which villages had been established. The first encomiendas were Acarigua, San Juan, Arauca, Aruca, Tacarigua, and Caura. Using the Trinidadian labor in the 17th and early 18th centuries, tobacco and later cacao were cultivated. But after a disastrous failure of the cacao crop in the 1720s, the industry declined. Thus, the island remained undeveloped well into the late 18th century. From 1776, the Spanish government encouraged Roman Catholics from the other Caribbean islands to settle in Trinidad with their slaves. This immigration became significant after the cedula, or decree of 1783, which offered generous land and tax incentives to settlers and transformed Trinidad's population, economy, and society. Most of the settlers were French, and French influence became dominant. Many enslaved people were brought in from the other colonies and from Africa. Plantations were established, production of cotton and sugar began, and trade increased markedly. By 1797, when Britain seized the island from Spain, Trinidad had begun its development as a plantation economy and a slave society. The British military conquest was formalized in 1802 in the Treaty of Amiens, the negotiation that ended the UK's conflict with revolutionary France. Under British rule, Trinidad's development as a sugar colony continued, although in 1806 and 07, 
the slave trade was completely prohibited. Slavery was abolished in two stages, between 1834 and 1838, and the sugarcane planters were unable to secure the steady, tractable, and cheap labor they wanted. As it happens, the most prominent slaveholder in Trinidad was a New Yorker educated in London, and he was also the first person to suggest bringing indentured servants from Asia to solve the shortage problems. His name was William Burnley. This began in 1845 when the first immigration of indentured workers from the Indian subcontinent came. It then continued until 1917. As early as 1870, about one-fourth of the total population consisted of Indo-Trinidadians. The original Trinidadian native inhabitants had by then virtually disappeared. Other immigrants came to Trinidad after 1838 from the smaller British Caribbean colonies, Africa, Madeira, China, Syria, Lebanon, Venezuela, and the United Kingdom. Trinidad's population became one of the most heterogeneous in the Caribbean. Tobago's early history is a separate story. Also cited by Columbus and claimed by Spain, the Spanish began calling it tobacco, although with varying spellings, around 1511, as it resembled the shape of the cigar the natives smoked. Given that it also lacked precious metals, at first it followed a similar development pattern as Trinidad, as the Spanish did not attempt to develop any settlement, but instead kept raiding the island in an attempt to enslave its inhabitants. This led to the decimation of the population. The first serious attempt at a settlement did not come until 1628 when the Dutch founded Fort Lysigen in a colony they called Nuvalkeren. Constant raids by the Spanish and fierce indigenous opposition, however, meant it was short-lived. It would fail just as multiple other attempts did as well in 1629 and 1632. Soon after, the Corlanders, a duchy that would eventually become present-day Latvia, would also try their luck and after multiple failed attempts would finally establish a longer lasting settlement in 1654 called New Courland. Incidentally, the duchy would be the second smallest state to try their hand at colonization in the Americas, surpassed only by Malta, who would also have a brief presence in the Caribbean during that period. During the 17th century, Tobago changed hands numerous times as the English, French, Dutch, and Corlanders wrestled for control. In 1704, it was declared a neutral territory, which left room for pirates to use the island as a base for raiding ships in the Caribbean. For the next nearly 60 years, the island would go back and forth between the French and the British as a small part of a much larger struggle between the two powers. In 1763, after the Seven Years' War, for instance, the French ceded it to the British and for the first time, the British would set up a successful sugar industry in the island. By 1777, its economy had flourished, and it was exporting large quantities of cotton, indigo, rum, and sugar. But in 1781, the French reinvaded Tobago and destroyed the plantations and forced the British governor to surrender. The island's buoyant economy fell into decline. French rule in the island would be victim to the fortunes of revolutionary France first, and later to Napoleon's empire. Thus, in 1814, the island would be ceded to the British for the last time as a result of the Treaty of Paris, the semi-final negotiation between Napoleon and the rest of Europe, as only a year later he would face final defeat at Waterloo. From that point on, the British tried to revive the sugar industry in Tobago, but by then it had already hit an irreversible decline. While lower sugar prices had already hit it hard, the last nail in the coffin was the Sugar Duties Act, which took away their tariff protection. Facing added competition from Cuba and Brazil, the industry collapsed. As Tobago's economy declined, so did its importance to the British government. To reduce the costs of ruling the island, the British government sought to unite Tobago with neighboring islands into a single administrative unit. In 1833, Tobago, Grenada, and St. Vincent were put under the authority of the governor of Barbados, but the island retained a representative assembly. A key turning point came in 1876 as a result of the Balmana riots. These occurred when police tried to control the unrest among Barbadian immigrant laborers at the Roxborough State on the southern coast of Tobago. But the crowd resisted and as a consequence, a woman was shot by the police while the person commanding the group, Corporal Balmana, 
was beaten to death by the mob and several other officers were injured. The event convinced the resident whites that there could be future problems like this one or like the Morant Bay Rebellion in Jamaica 11 years earlier. Thus, they began to think that Tobago would be better protected if they became a pure crown colony constitution, that is, one with direct British rule and no elected legislative assembly. So they looked to become unified with Trinidad, a colony that had never enjoyed any type of self-rule because unlike Tobago and other British Caribbean colonies, Trinidad had become part of the empire as a result of military conquest. This government setup would remain in place until 1925. The lack of representation and inequality in the unified islands sometimes turned explosive. The most famous example of this were the water riots of 1903. The underlying cause of these were first the abolishment of the local government at Port of Spain and second an increase in the cost of water as the government decreed the installation of water meters in private homes. Locals immediately organized to protest this under the leadership of Emmanuel Mzumbo Lazare. This culminated on March 23rd outside the Red House, the seat of the country's executive council. Protesters threw rocks at the building, smashing windows and eventually setting it on fire. The police then opened fire on the crowd, killing 16 people and injuring 42 others. The fire completely gutted the Red House had to be entirely rebuilt in 1907. During the British colonial period, many activists sought to change the constitution to allow the inclusion of some elected members on the Trinidad and Tobago Legislative Council. In 1925, a constitutional reform did that, adding seven elected members. Further agitation, especially an island-wide series of strikes and riots in 1937 under Grenadan-born leader Uriah Butler led to the grant of universal suffrage in 1945 and other constitutional reforms that provided for a measure of self-government. Butler was jailed from 1937 to 1939 and then rearrested when the United Kingdom entered World War II and jailed for the duration of the war. After his release in 1945, Butler reorganized his political party, the British Empire Citizens and Workers Home Rule Party. This party won a plurality in the 1950 general elections, but the establishment feared Butler as a radical, and thus, Albert Gomez became the first chief minister of Trinidad and Tobago instead. The 1956 general elections saw the emergence of the People's National Movement under the leadership of Eric Williams. The PNM, a nationalist outfit on the center left, would go on to dominate politics in Trinidad and Tobago for the next three decades. Its main opposition was the Democratic Labor Party, a fusion of parties with various ideological factions, but mostly anti-communist, led by Dr. Rudnarath Kapildeo and Ashford Sinanan, who later founded the West Indian National Party. Williams became Prime Minister at Independence and remained in that position until his death in 1981. In 1958, the United Kingdom tried to establish an independent West Indies Federation comprising most of the other British West Indies. However, this agreement over the structure of the Federation led to Jamaica's withdrawal. Eric Williams responded to this with his now famous calculation, one from ten leaves not. Trinidad and Tobago chose not to bear the financial burden without Jamaica's assistance and the Federation collapsed. So instead, Trinidad and Tobago gained full independence on August 31, 1962 within the Commonwealth, with Queen Elizabeth II as its titular head of state. On August 1, 1976, the country dropped that too, and opted to be a republic. And the last Governor General, Sir Ellis Clark, became the first head of state or president. The PNM won six consecutive elections and held power from 1956 to 1986. Despite the continuity and stability in government, there were economic problems and social unrest, which broke out in widespread disturbances in 1970 to 1971. This was because much of the promise to black Trinidadians had been left unfulfilled as the colonial legacy of discrimination persisted and this fueled the black power protests in the island. The black power revolution of 1970 nearly brought down the government especially after the police killed Basil Davis, a young protester. 
but the government ended up suppressing the movement enough that Eric Williams's government, although weakened, survived. In the end, what really calmed things and changed the island was the 1973-1981 oil boom. Oil as a resource was not new to the islands. Famously, the largest natural deposit of asphalt in the world is at Pitch Lake, not far from Port of Spain, something that Walter Raleigh discovered could be used to caulk some of his ships all the way back in 1595. Not surprisingly then, that's where the first oil well was drilled, although it took until 1857 for that to happen. Oil increased in importance over the years for the Trinidadian economy. In 1940, it produced as much as 40% of the oil within the British Empire. Its production levels, however, did not truly take off until the 1960s when vast reserves were discovered. Thus, when oil prices skyrocketed in the 1970s, production exploded and so did the government's tax intake. This boom brought sudden prosperity to most sections of the population and Trinidad and Tobago entered a period of rapid development and industrialization in the period between 1973 and 1981. A substantial state sector and fairly comprehensive social welfare programs were created from the petroleum profits, while the private sector expanded rapidly. But just like it happened with other oil countries, a collapse in oil prices created major economic problems. This, along with the PNM's failure to win support from most Indo-Trinidadians and deep-seated corruption, led to a marked decline in the party's popularity after 1981, the year of Williams's death. In December 1986, the National Alliance of Reconstruction, or NAR, a coalition party led by A.N.R. Robinson, won the majority of seats on a program calling for divestment of most state-owned companies, reorganization of the civil service, and structural readjustment of the economy in light of the shrinking oil revenues. Although the NIR government succeeded somewhat in stimulating economic growth while keeping inflation low, its policies were widely resented and the party was damaged by splits and defections. In July 1990, a small radical Muslim group called Jamet al-Muslimin attempted a coup in which several ministers, including Robinson, the prime minister, were held hostage. The armed group then took over the only TV station and tried to convince the country that the government had been overthrown and they were now in charge. Everyone is safe. No one has been harmed. The army, however, had other ideas and after six days, the group surrendered. In the end, 24 people died, including Leo de Vigne, a member of parliament. All the members of Jamet al-Muslimin would be charged with treason, but later, all of them, along with their leader, Abu Bakr, would be granted amnesty. To this day, it remains the only militant Islamic coup attempt in the Western Hemisphere. Although the coup failed, it severely weakened NAR, and the party was defeated the very next election in December 1991, when the PNM returned to power. Since then, Trinidadian politics have been dominated by the PNM and the United National Congress, or UNC, a center-left party traditionally supported by Indo-Trinidadians and other minorities, it has managed to elect two prime ministers. The first was its founder and first Indo-Trinidadian prime minister, Basdeo Pandey, and the country's first female prime minister, Kamla Persad Bisesar, also of Indian descent. The current prime minister, however, is Keith Rowley of the PNM, serving his second term that began in 2020. Today, Trinidad and Tobago are one of the richest countries per capita in the Western Hemisphere, but they face serious challenges. The first is their overdependence on oil, and the second are security problems related to drug trafficking and to a disproportionate number of recruits for Islamic State that come from Trinidad and Tobago. There have been many Trinidadian jihadists that have been killed in Iraq and Syria, and there's a concern that those who return could radicalize others or find local or regional jihadi projects. Thus, compared to the rest of the region, Trinidad and Tobago has a solid democracy, but similar problems. How well they'll manage those challenges is as yet unclear.